sermon that I want to bring is like uh, continuing on the idea of our walk with God. We started last week about seven times in the book of Ephesians. Uh, it is mentioned something about our, our walk in the Lord. We'll see it in the next slide. Um, we have seen last week the three first one. You walked. We once walked in sins. And uh, through the work of God saving us by His grace and the wonderful mercy and the richness of His grace, we are now being transformed and God is working in our lives and He is inviting us to walk, doing the good things that He has prepared for us and to walk worthy of our calling. And today we want to emphasize that walk no longer as Gentiles do. The, the change of our walk, the, the, the call, the strong call, the insistence of scriptures to, to walk like the Lord wants us to, to walk. And I want to skip over because of time. I don't have time to follow all, all the, the structure of the, the message. Go to slide number six when we talk about do not make the Holy Spirit sad uh, or do not grieve the Holy Spirit as you will read in many Bible versions because that's that's how we read it uh, usually. And I've been thinking many times I read that uh, scriptures do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And I've been struggling a little bit with uh, the idea of that uh, scriptures, how to understand it, how to apply it. And I, I've studied on the subjects and uh, I think God is leading me to talk on this subject specifically today. So Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30, and don't make the Holy Spirit sad. God gave you his spirit as proof or the seal you belong to him and that he will keep you safe until the day of redemption. Praise the Lord that we have the Holy Spirit. So we do not have to live like the Gentiles, like the nations, like this world lives. And in this chapter, starting in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, going down, there's very strong and shocking descriptions of the lifestyle of non-believers, even in our generation. And one of the things that we discussed the first service is that the, the, the shocking descriptions that Paul is making of people outside of Christ and how... In moving away from the Lord, they became gradually more and more um, deep in their sin and, and uh, having a, a greater appetite for more sin and, uh, sin and uncleanness. And so we, we have seen that in the, in, the, in the first service about this. So that now we are invited, that reminded that we are been made a new creation and we have to get rid of the old one the old clothes and the old conducts and manners, and now we are invited to wear the new us, the new you, and the, just like when we remove our clothes and God. So now we are coming to this point here. Uh, when we do not live in the way that God wants us to live, I think we can understand that. You, 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 we all have emotions and we all have been sad at times or disappointed or hurt by something. We have feeling, we know the areas of emotion, but sometimes it's like we, we think of God like uh, and His holiness on His throne way, 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 way up there and that He is so not like us sometimes and that He is not so near to us because we read in Hebrew that we do not have a high priest that do not sympathize, that cannot sympathize with us. So, so he does sympathize. He does know what we need. And he come to our rescue in our times of needs. So he's nearer to us than we think. So I want to talk here how we can grieve the Holy Spirit. What it means to grieving the Holy Spirit. And also understanding some truths or even positive thought about the, this uh, concept of the Holy Spirit grieving. So let's go to number one. How can we grieve the Holy Spirit? Of course, when we neglect holiness, purity, when we neglect that and we accept to sin, or disobey willingly, or ignore what our conscience is warning of, it will grieve the Holy Spirit. So th I think we can understand that. We also, when we think only about materialistic, the Lord has made us to be new creations. And in Colossians, we are invited to lift our hands, our, he our heads to heaven, and have the mind of Christ, and to think that the things above, 
But when you and I, we only live for the, the now and here, for the materialistic, all of our goals, all of our thoughts, all of our plans, our aspiration, it's only materialistic, it will grieve the Holy Spirit because he's done so much for us to redeem us and bring us and he has given his Holy Spirit to live in us. So when we forget about all the, the rich inheritance and the spiritual aspects of, of, of our life and only live and focus for the materials for the here and now, then it will grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit exalt Jesus, is that right? That's his main uh, descriptions. That's, that's what he does. He's the expert. He's the one that leads us into that. So when your word and your conduct don't exalt Jesus, it will grieve the Holy Spirit. And I think that's an easy concept to understand. Because if the Holy Spirit who lives in us, his ministry is to exalt Jesus, and my way of life is not uh, exalting Jesus, then it will grieve the Holy Spirit. Why is he le leading his life like this when he could be glorifying Jesus? When we read anything, watch anything, and spend more time on our Facebook post, and we have not read our Bibles, then we are grieving the Holy Spirit. I think we understand that as well. When we have no time for prayer, but we are, the Holy Spirit sees that we are very active and doing worldly things, I think it will grieve the Holy Spirit because we have no time. And the Holy Spirit who is sent to help us in our prayers, and we neglect prayers, we don't have time. We, we have time for anything else for activities, amusement, relaxations, and everything, but not with the Holy Spirit. Then he grieves because he sees that you and I, we love worldly things more than we love him. Do you agree with this? Yes, yes? it makes sense. But there's also a very positive thought about the Holy Spirit grieving. The fact that it is said of the Holy Spirit that he grieves, shows us something very important for your relationship to God. It shows us that the Holy Spirit is truly a person. Because only a person can grieve. Also, more encouraging, it means that He loves us so much. Because only a person who loves can grieve. Person, parents love their children, they do something horrible, they will grieve. We, we, we hurt one another, we will grieve. Because we love one another and we care for one another. So it's, it's good. The fact that he is grieving brings a dimension of our understanding of who is the Holy Spirit in a very different way. Another thing that really touched me when I uh, discovered that, the infinite and eternal God is, wants to be so near to us with, and desires such a close communion with you and me that even his emotions are affected by my conduct. This I say wow to that. Because the, the big God out there that created the world eternal, is so big, so rich, so, so wise and everything, my conduct will affect his emotions. That is something to think about. So when we think about don't make the Holy Spirit sad, it is possible to make the Holy Spirit sad. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. It is. How, how, how does he grieve? He grieves for you. He grieves for us. And also many times we think of ourselves like very insignificant. But God grieves over us through our conduct, our words, and everything. Another thought that also is really good about the Holy Spirit grieving, he grieves not because he's Ill easily offended, over easily offended, like we are many times. Like if somebody, you know, some, some Christians or some maybe member of your family, you know, they are very touchy. You have to be careful what you say, what you will do, because they can become very, very offended by something. Easily offended, quickly offended. We have people like that around us. But the Bible declares very, very clearly that our God is rich in mercy and slow to anger. So the Holy Spirit is not easily grieved. 
So if he grieves, it's not because he is easily grieved, it's because something deeply touched his emotions. And the, the reason why the Holy Spirit grieves, he grieves for you and for me, for our sake. Why did I say that? Because the Holy Spirit, more than anyone else, knows what sin will do to you and to me. The devastation, the mess that it will cause. So the Holy Spirit has to grieve. If he loves us and he knows us and he, he, he sees us practicing sin or uh, going along with the sinful behavior, of course he will, he will grieve for us, for me. He grieves also because he is God and he understands more than any human being the price, the cost of our redemption. The, Jesus, who is a member of the Godhead, who came, God eternal, and to humble himself, became a man, died for you and me. The suffering, the pains, and all the plan of redemption, the Holy Spirit understands that. So he grieves when he sees that we do not consider that enough, that we are returning to sin, that we are allowing ourselves or giving ourselves license to, to sin. It will certainly affect the Holy Spirit and his emotions. It also, the Holy Spirit grieves also because he knows how it will affect our communion with God. You know, you and I, I think we understand that. For me, I know that if I know that I have uh, done something displeasing to the Lord, I'm not really inclined easily. There's something that blocks me to throw myself to prayer. It's like there's a something that is happening. And it does that. The Holy Spirit understands that so much that when you and I, we allow sin in our life, it will uh, affect our communion with the Lord. So the Holy Spirit knows that. The Holy Spirit will grieve over any form of sin, sin commit anywhere, sin in society to the unbeliever, but he will grieve more when sin is from his people. Because we've been redeemed, because we belong to him, because we, we're supposed, we have the power to break free from the slavery of sin, and then we are choosing to go back there, so it will, the Holy Spirit will grieve. Not that he will hate us, never, but it will affect his emotions. The Holy Spirit would not be the Holy Spirit if he wouldn't grieve when there's something false and impure in our lives. If he is holy, if he is who he is, if he is the third person in the Trinity, he will grieve when he sees something impure in us. The favorite ministry of God's Holy Spirit is to glorify Christ and glorify Christ in his church, glorify Christ in our lives, and to change believers into the likeness of Jesus. That's what he is good, that's what he is here. The Holy Spirit is our best friend. He takes us by the hand and he molds us and he transforms us and he sanctifies us and he brings into the likeness of Jesus. He prepares us for, for heaven. So it will grieve him when believers' spiritual progress is interrupted by sin. And then he will have to change his ministry and to a ministry of leading us to repentance and restoration. So these are some thoughts about how we can grieve the Holy Spirit. In the strong call, do not make the Holy Spirit, do not let your conduct, do not let your words. And there's a, a long list of sins. This section, chapter 4, 17, until chapter 6, will have a lot of very practical descriptions of, of sinful behavior and godly behavior. The contrast will be there. So it's, it starts with the, the comparis, comparing to the horrible sin of the pagans or the nations or the unsaved. And for some of us, I think it's a little bit difficult to associate ourselves with these sins because we will look at that and say, no, I'm not like that. I go to church, I'm a Christian, so I'm not affecting, uh, affected by that. But there's another list of sins that maybe you will feel more, uh, uh, that you will identify more with. It's the kind of sin that comes to, let me see, slide number five. Go to slide number five. We will go to the play. I will call this uh, list of sin here, sinful behavior, the sin of temper and of the tongue. 
because it's, it has to do with uh, our, our emotions, our reactions, our temper. We get angry, we shout, we say something hurtful, our words are being corrupt and all of these things. So you see a very quickly a description, stop telling lies. Don't, don't sin and letting anger control you. If, if you use to take money out of someone, then stop doing that and work hard. So why should we, you work hard with your hands? You should work hard so that you will earn your own living. So you, you will not have to steal anybody anymore. But then it is also that you will give generously to others. That's the goal. Imagine the, the extreme contrast, the, the opposite thoughts. You used to take what was not yours for yourself to satisfy your own need. You, you, okay, instead of working, just take it from someone. And then you are being transformed that now, not only you use it for yourself, which is already an improvement, but you are blessing other people. You are generous to help other people. So that's a big, big difference. You know, when the wallet is converted, there's a true conversion over there. So, so that, that is something very important. And how can we uh, define some of these uh, uh, expressions here? S telling lies. Sometimes lies is not like a, an absolute lies. The more deceitful lies are half, half and half. Part is true, part is half. An exaggeration, bending the meaning, hiding uh, insinuations. You want to talk against somebody, but you don't want to say things directly about, so you just lead the conversations and have enough <laughs> insinuation so that at the end the other person will say, yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. So that would be telling lies, I would say. Don't let anger control you. And if you look at this verse here, you see uh, some repetitions of the same, but in a different, different way. Bitterness, a resentment that leads to unwillingness to forgive. The burst of rage here, the mini Bible version will have the word wrath, a furious anger, is a really outburst of the moment. It, it just explodes, it just takes you by surprise. It just come out, is a, a burst immediately, and that's a, a bit of different with anger. Anger is a little bit more calculated. Anger is like, I want you to know that I am angry with you, and I want you to feel that I am angry with you, so I will punish you. <laughs> in a certain way. Uh, and many times people will do the silent treatment. It's one of the, 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 the things that we do. So, so anger is a bit different from the first one. Burst of rage is uh, an outburst. And uh, the other one is a little bit more uh, calculated. Or, or to remain grouchy. Any one of you wake up grouchy in the morning? Yes. And then you have the word clamor. That is a, a loud outcries of anger, evil speaking, shouting, insulting, shoutings, and things like that. And malice, which is wish, wishing evils on others or something. So we would think that these things are not in the church. But I think they are. Yeah. And they are in your life, they are in my life. Not all the time. Sometimes I may do very well. I may be 98% you know, free of these things. And then suddenly an event, a person, a uh, situation comes and then I show that I have still have the potential of that. And that, of course, you understand, that would grieve the Holy Spirit, don't you think so? Yeah? Okay, so we agree on these ones. And I want to finish with the most beautiful thought of this chapter, since we are now members of the family of God, since we are now, we have removed the old clothes, we have taken on the new, the new me, created to be like God, and holiness and righteousness and resemblance to Jesus. The, probably the high, one of the highest level of maturity to resemble Jesus the most is expressed in the last 
uh, uh, one here, Ephesians chapter one, four, verse 32. That's kind of the closing statement of chapter four. And it is so beautiful. This is what you and I, we should be resembling, practicing. This is who we are in Christ to be. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted or compassionate, Forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. When I'm studying this text and its context, I realize many important things here. When it says be kind to one another, it's uh, really a keep on becoming kinder and kinder, more kind. The word kind is also, if you look at the root word, is handle lightly, be gentle with a person, that person. Go, 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 go easy with that person. These are the exact uh, translation of what it means to be kind. Don't be harsh, like, because we, we have described the previous screen. So now we come to the, the contrasting aspect, to Jesus' uh, way. We were looking at sinful ways. Now we're looking at Jesus' ways. So we have to grow. We have to keep on becoming better at that. Because we are in our sinful nature, or our selfishness, or pride, we are inclined to be the other way around. And to, unfortunately, keep grieving the Holy Spirit. But here, we close with this beautiful statement to be just as Christ to us. And you will notice that in order to do that, it is always about forgiveness. And that makes me think that uh, the forgiveness here is one of the most important topic of the New Testament. Think about it. It's in every book. Jesus teach about forgiveness. We are being called to be like our Heavenly Father in forgiveness. And God is rich in mercy and He forgives and He does not keep His anger. We are called to be like Jesus to forgive. We are told if you don't forgive, what will happen to you? We have parable about uh, forgiveness and not judging, which is also works together. So the, the theme of forgiveness is all over the New Testament, repeated, insisted upon, and always the highest quality, the highest value of the New Testament is forgiveness. And then I'm wondering, why is it that forgiveness is put, put right above all? Above all you, you, have, you find forgiveness over there. It's for a very simple reason that you understand. Because we are sinful people. And because we are sinful people, we will behave as sinful people do sometimes, at times. And you sometimes will hurt me. And sometimes I will hurt you. That's almost inevitable, that it will happen, disappointment, something, a, a betrayal, words that are, we should not have spoken, it will happen to you, to me, you and your husband, or vice versa, children, it's a, your cousins and your friends and your colleagues and your whatever, brothers and sisters, it will happen over and over and over. That's why Peter says, seven times, Lord, with that person, and then I'm okay seven times. He says, not seven times. Uh, increase it many, many times, as many times as it will happen, continue to do it. So let me give you some thoughts about the amazing forgiveness of God to, to lift up our, our motivation toward forgiveness. Number one, remember, God holds back his anger a long time. To you, he has done that. He's slow to anger many times. How long did it take to God before you responded to his call to salvation? How many years have he bear with you, with your stubbornness and your sinful ways and your rejections? So God bears with us a long time. Though, during this time, we provoke God. Each time we say no to God, we don't respond to God, we are provoking Him. We are continuing in sin. We know God is calling us, but we are going. So when, we, when you think about God's forgiveness, remember that how long He has bear with us and His anger He hold back for a long time. Number two, God always makes the first move in forgiveness. 
always. It's always him first. It's never, oh, I'm tired of my life. I want to be, you know, a friend of God. It's never like this. It's always God making the first move. And it's always God making the first move more than one time. Trying to reconcile the, the guilty party even when the guilty party is uninterested. God is trying to reach out to you. You are uninterested. You do not reply or accept his forgiveness. God will initiate again and he will make the first move again and again and again until you will, re even when man rejects him again and again, God is always the one making the first moves in forgiveness. Does that tell you something? Yes. God forgive our sins knowing, oh wow, this one is good. God forgives our sin knowing that we will sin again. Wow. This is, a, this is a wow thing here. You know, like me, I'm okay to forgive you, but don't do it again, okay? <laughs> but God will forgive us again, even though he knows that we will betray him again. That's uh, only God can, I think, do that. God's forgiveness is so complete and glorious that he adopts even former um, offenders into his family. Imagine you, you, you are a family, and there's a court case, and there are some offenders, criminals over there. And will you accept, adopt them as your own children and your own family? God does that with us. So for us, we will say, oh, I'm not sure about them. Their background, their education, their moral standards. I I'm not ready to adopt them in my family. But God adopt us. Poor, rich, ignorant, educated Whatever it is, he, he accepts us and he adopts us as his children. God's forgiveness offers complete restoration and honor. When he forgives, he reinstates you. He gives you all the honor. God requires no probation, probation period to receive his forgiveness. You know, sometimes you and I would say, okay, let's see. If that person will behave. Let's see if he is really sincere. Let's see in six months if he has really changed. So we give buffer time. We examine people like this. God forgives us completely without a probation period. When he says, I forgive you, it's forgiven for good. When he forgives us, he put his trust in us. And he invites us to work with him as co-laborer. That is the highest level of trust that you have. So in closing, this text summarizes how we can be the most like Jesus. And these simple words, no, the, the, before the, the verse 432, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving one another, keep on forgiving one another, just as God and Christ Forgive us. Amen? Amen? That's how we will not grieve the Holy Spirit. That's how we are showing maturity, grace. God, God has treated us with so much grace. Oh, wow, wonderful. It's so wonderful. If we treat others as God treats us, we will fulfill all the teaching of Paul in this one. The, our forgiving of others should follow the patterns of Jesus forgiving us. When we think of the amazing way God forgives us, it would be shameful to refuse forgiveness to someone. And even though it is true, we still would, would do it? No, that would grieve the Holy Spirit. So we have received so much grace, so much compassion, so much mercy and forgiveness. We extend it because Jesus is honored in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Father God, we